Hello everyone, this is Arturo Gomez and for today we're going to talk about finite element analysis method. The purpose of today's session is to give you a very brief overview of the theoretical concepts behind uh, this method. We're not going to jump into a detailed mathematical demonstration, but I'm going to try to give you an insight of what software does when you perform a calculation. So first of all, why do we need a finite element uh, model? So it turns out that in our space structures, as in many other structures, sometimes we have very complex uh, scenarios with complexities. And uh, sometimes this is very hard to develop analytical tools or analytical uh, models to solve them. So we use a computational model based on a numerical procedure that helps to understand uh, the structures better and to get the information that, that at the end we want. What kind of complexities uh, arise when we're talking about other space structures? Sometimes we have uh, complex geometries. As you can see, for example, in these slides, the wind section is precisely uh, not a simple structure. It has a bunch of different components, uh, different beams, different stringers, different drips. In addition, we have a very uh, complex loading scenarios. We have loads that are either created by the pilot, such as the air loads and maneuvering loads, uh, takeoff, landing, and cabin pressure. But we have also loads related to the environment, like a turbulence or impact loads due to a uh, foreign object uh, impact or something like that. And the thing with them is that they are also very complex. Pressure distributions over a, a wing and, and, and an airfoil are not precisely easy to parameterize. So that's the reason why we use finite element analysis, because it allows us to make something uh, or to make this kind of an analysis possible. And additional complexity is that in composite in our space structures, we used to use uh, a lot of uh, different materials, including composite materials. And those are materials that are characterized by an, an isotropic behavior, uh, different uh, with, with different properties along different directions. So this is also much easier to handle through a numerical computational code than through an analytical uh, method. At the end, the finite element analysis is a um, computational method that allows us to understand what is the behavior of the structure by dividing the structure into very small uh, parts that are called elements. After that, they are solved, each one of them, and, and they're uh, allocated in a, in a big matrix that can be uh, solved using numerical methods. This is called the stiffness matrix. Instead of analyzing the whole structure uh, as a whole, you start dividing it into small pieces, and after that, you can treat each one of them and assemble them at the end. First of all, we, we define the problem domain. We try to make it as simple as possible uh, in such a way that we can apply the loads, that we can apply the wonder conditions in the most representative manner of the real situation. Uh, after that, we discretize these into the elements. And <clears throat> uh, after applying the loads and the other conditions, we form a set of equations that we're able to solve using different techniques. And we get at the end of a bunch of data of what's going on in, at each single point inside the, uh, our domain. How does this finite element uh, model works? So first we um create a mesh right so this mesh is defined by a series of nodes these series of, of nodes are the connect the connecting points in the in the domain that relate one element to the other and uh, after doing that we manage to link each one of these nodes and each one of the SL, uh, dc elements through an assembly process further we apply the other conditions and loads has previously stated, and we solve these equations uh, using their different techniques for solving, and we'll go in detail later. Most of the time, we try to simplify our structure to make it as simple as possible, decreasing the number of degrees of freedom that we want. And uh, the reason why this method is called finite element method is because the number of uh, elements that we have over our domain is a, a finite number. It's not an infinite one as uh, when, when we develop analytical methods uh, based on the continuum and, and the continuum of the material or in the continuum of the structure. Depending of, on how many elements do we have, we will get a better precision of our result. For that reason, it's always important to choose the proper number of finite elements. We have a bunch of uh, commercial packages of uh, FEA analysis. Uh, among the most famous ones are the ones that I'm showing you here, 
Abacus, Ansys, Nestrum Patron, LS Dyna. And in our case, we're going to use uh, Abacus, right? Abacus is a software developed by the Salt Systems. It's a software that was initially created by people from the Cambridge University. And well, it's, it's a software that uh, is used for major companies around the world, in, in, including Airbus, including uh, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, and, and so on. So you can imagine that it's a very powerful tool in that sense. <clears throat> For building a finite element model, and particularly a linear a static finite element model, that is the one that we're going to work right now, we have always to uh, design, first of all, our geometry that is going to be our domain. We have to define a series of material properties of the material that we're going to work with. We will have to apply some boundary conditions, uh, loading conditions and constraints, always being aware that these loading conditions and boundary conditions they have to satisfy the static equilibrium. And in the case that we have a more complex scenarios, we may use contact interfaces and friction and so on. Those are uh, some cool examples of how a uh, finite element uh, works. Uh, on the left, we have a wing structure and how the probably the stresses are uh, distributed over the wing. We have in the center landing gear, the, the one of the links of the landing gear. Also, probably is a stress distribution. And uh, at the end, on the right, we have the inlet of the jet engine, and probably they're analyzing the impact behavior. I think it is impact behavior of one blade, one fan blade. Depending on how rough or, or how fine is our mesh, it will definitely give us better results or uh, worse results. So this is an example of how we should mesh a hole, for example. This process of increasing the number of elements is called refinement of the mesh. So at the end, what we do is that we take our domain that is continuous in our minds and in reality, and we start discretizing it in the, in the most um, consistent approach. We have to bear in mind that uh, DC elements, they cannot overlap, first of all. So they, they, they have to be perfectly connected to each other, and that none of DC elements can leave the domain uncovered. So what it means is that all the elements that we use have to be, have the summation of all DC um, is small volumes have to be the entire uh, initial domain. This is a very simple example of how we will discretize a cantilever beam. So we have the continuous in the upper part and we're applying the load uh, on, on the tip and it is uh, fixed on, on the left side. And as you can see, we discretize it uh, using five different elements, each one of them with four nodes. Depending on the kind of geometry that we are going to model, we may use different kinds of elements. So we have for uh, one dimensional analysis, we may have uh, lines and, and, and bars. Let's assume the case that you want to analyze a truss structure or uh, mechanisms or things like this. So this kind of mold, this kind of elements are, are perfect. We also have two dimensional elements that are, uh, as their names say, they are only two dimensional. So they are seem to be a kind of surface elements in which we have only in plane degrees of freedom or the, the only degrees of freedom acting are uh, on plane. And finally, we have three dimensional uh, degrees of freedom in which we have active all the degrees of freedom and they're usually uh, used to represent uh, three dimensional structures or structures that cannot be uh, accurately represented with the other elements. So uh, here we have an example. We divide our domain in a series of elements and each one of the each one of these elements is going to be independent and is going to have its own nodes. Each one of them is going to have its own local uh, node numbering. Please bear in mind this. The node one for element two is different to the node one for element five, an example. Okay, so bear in mind. Well, as you will see later, we'll have to assemble all these nodes in our final matrix. So uh, here the, the procedure goes, as I mentioned to you before, we have a, a series of unknowns uh, because we don't know where the placements in, at each one of these nodes that we created. So we try to express how DC displacements at each one of these nodes and inside of the elements they how they vary, and the way that we do that is using um, 
an, an approximation function, right? So we, we try we, we do an assumption that the displacements between each one of the nodes is given according to a function, right? And we, it's called interpolation function, and we'll talk about this later. The important thing here is that we can correlate the displacement at any point in the domain with the displacements at each one of the nodes. We, we, we know that the displacement at each point inside an element can be given by his coordinates or by his uh, displacements in the axis x, y, and z, right? And we can say also that this vector, this uh, position vector, or the, this displacement vector in reality, can be given through the multiplication of a matrix, that is this n matrix, this is the uh, matrix of interpolation function, multiplied by a vector. And this vector is the displacement at each one of the nodes. So we can, we can say that, for example, we want to know what is the uh, displacement in the center of the element two, in this case. So for doing that, we're going to assume that this displacement in the middle is going to be related to the displacement in the node one, node two, and node three. And the way of correlating them is through a mathematical function. Well, this is more or less what I uh, was explaining to you before. This a interpolation functions that are also called the shape functions. Those are functions that are dependent on the coordinate system that we're using, and they are dependent on x, y, and z. They're usually uh, either linear functions or quadratic functions. Uh, here we can just see how these interpolation functions will work for each one of the displacement components in x, y, and z. And well, you can see here the summation uh, like a decimation symbol, because for each node that we have, we may have a interpolation uh, function, right? So that's the reason. In finite element analysis, we also have a like a very big bunch of um, material models. Among the most uh, commonly used ones are the homogeneous and linear elastic. Uh, once. In this case, we're going to use linear elastic, but we can model our materials in with many using many, many other different kinds of uh, approaches. We can model also nonlinear elastic materials, plasticity, viscoelastic behavior, uh, and isotropic materials, orthotropic like composite materials, and so on. Finite element analysis, uh, without going too much into detail, we have three different approaches for solving this kind of phenomena, right? We have the direct approach that is very much related to the direct uh, stimulus method. We have the second approach that is a variational pro approach in which you, we use a uh, functional, that in our case is the potential energy, and we start building our expressions, our uh, main differential equations that we're going to see later, um, based on this, on the optimization of this potential, right? And we have the third one that is the weighted residuals approach that is the most the, the most widely used is the one that Abacus uses, mm, but uh, and, and it, it is very much related with with the theorem of the virtual work, but we're not going to touch it in, in reality. This is uh, this is uh, those are affairs like a, for more advanced courses. So let's talk about the variational approach that is probably the easiest to understand and uh, that gives us a better insight into the physics behind it. So we have to start thinking that uh, for any kind of a structure, you may have, we, we may have a, a potential energy in the system, right? And this potential energy in the system is going to be the summation of different kinds of energies that are acting into our volume. So we may have, uh, first of all, some strain energy that is stored in the element, each one of the elements. Here we're, gonna, we're, we're looking only at the element level. Always that you see subscript E is for the element level. So we have this strain energy stored inside the element. When you apply some force or, or uh, yeah, when you stretch or compress a material, you store some energy inside, right? So this is this term. It's an integral of the uh, internal energy or the whole domain. We have also some uh, work done by body forces, for example, weight or uh, uh, centrifugal forces or stuff like that or uh, electromagnetic fields or yeah and finally we have some work due to surface forces for example if you apply a pressure over one side of our domain 
right? You're, you're generating or you're creating a work. And we can start analyzing, for example, the first one, the first term, that is this one over here. We can start analyzing the uh, strain energy per unit of volume in terms of state of stress strain of the material. So here you will see that the strain energy is related to the strain tensor and the stress tensor. But we can also rearrange this equation and we can simply define that the strain energy inside the element is related to the strain state, how much deformed is this little element, and our material property metrics. That what are the material properties of our material? What, are the, uh, what, is, what is the stiffness of our material? Remember that a material that has higher stiffness stores less energy than one that has a lower stiffness, right? So it's just an example. And finally, so if you can see here, we have the internal energy in terms of the strain. And we are able to express this strain, strain tensor over here, in terms of our node displacements, our, the, our displacements in the nodes. Yes? Uh, we'll, very, we'll very much simplify our lives. But for doing that, we have to use this matrix B that the matrix B is just the, uh, the partial derivative, our interpolation function that I mentioned to you before. Okay, so we managed to describe our stress tensor at any part of the structure related to the derivative, the partial derivative of our interpolation function times the displacements at each one of the nodes. And this is one of the magic parts of final element analysis. That would you manage to express a field that is unknown and to approximate it to an interpolation function. After doing some rearrangement, you can find that the potential energy in the system, uh, it can be expressed as one half of the displacements at each one of the nodes multiplied by this matrix, that is the K matrix, this matrix is important, and this matrix is just this, is the integral inside the element of this strain displacement matrix, the material property matrix, and this is called the local stiffness matrix, okay? So here in this part, on the left, we have our internal energy component, and uh, at the end, if we continue doing the same approximations, we also may find another uh, vector that, that is called the forcing uh, vector over the element. So at the end, it's just uh, a way of manipulating the matrices and, 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 and so on. This K is the element stiffness matrix, that is this integral that you see over here. And this QE is the load vector over the element that is given by this. Remember that N is the interpolation function, T is the transpose of the interpolation function then. This FB, those are the uh, volume forces, like weight, for example. And this T are the tractions or the surface loads. And this DS is the um, infinitesimal surface over which this load is applied. Once we have uh, defined our expression at the element level, the next step is to assemble all DC uh, equations of each one of these uh, DC elements into a global matrix of the entire system. So for this, we have to create something called an element connectivity matrix. That is, that, that at the end is just a matrix that is able to create an equivalence between the global nodes. If we have a displacements at the element level, we can express DC displacements at the global level. This matrix is going to be zero in, in almost all cases, except when the number of the, of the element coincides with the number of the element in the global domain. And I think this is easier to, to explain using this slide. Imagine that you have over here our uh, whole domain, 
we divide it on three elements, and each one of these elements at the global level has a different uh, number, right? So we have here node one, node two, node three, node four, node five, right? Now let's think about the uh, one of the elements, right? Let's imagine about, let's think about the element one, for example. In element one, we're gonna have a local numbering of nodes that is gonna be this one here, two here, and three here, right? So we need to find a way of correlating this lo local numbering to the global numbering. This is more or less how a uh, connecti connectivity matrix will, will look like. This is uh, the connectivity matrix for this uh, case. As I was mentioning to you before, this matrix is zero in all the places where the numbering doesn't coincide and is one for the one that coincides. For example, here, this first term, you can clearly see that the node one at the element level coincides with the node one at the global level. That's the reason why it's one over here. And you can keep tracking all of them. <clears throat> Using this definition, we can just uh, replace in our previous expression, or yeah, we, we can express the displacements at the element level through the displacements at the uh, global level using our assembly matrix. And we can just plug this inside our equation. And I will, I'll, at the end, what we will have is the total potential energy of the whole system given through the displacements of each node at the global system, using as a reference the global system. And this is where the magic occurs. Because once this thing happens, we can just uh, rearrange our uh, assembly matrices together with the local stiffness matrices. And we obtain something called the global stiffness matrix. That is, it's a very big, it's a very large matrix, and you will find it many, many times in literature. It's a matrix that tells us how, what, what is the stiffness of the structure, and how the stiffness of the structure relates to each one of the degrees of freedom of the structure at each one of the nodes okay and uh, when we do when we take exactly the same uh, approach over the load uh, vector we also find a global forcing vector that is mainly telling us that at each node in the global domain we may have a uh, one force so and at the end and, and it is here highlighted in red the total potential is given by the internal energy of the structure that is given by this part that can be given in terms of the displacements at each one of the nodes and the global stiffness matrix. And on top of that, or additionally to that, we have the work done by all the forces at each one of the nodes. We have uh, to remember that all our structures are going to be subjected to a series of boundary conditions. Uh, we may have some forces acting directly over certain nodes of the domain. And these nodes can arise from the boundary conditions of the structure itself or the, or the airplane. You may have some loads that are related to the lift of the airplane, the drag, the weight, the thrust. And so all of them, all these loads, they come here into this vector, depending on where they are acting, depending on uh, uh, over which degree of freedom they are acting. For so solving this equation, and this is the last part I'm going to treat here, what we have to do is uh, we have to optimize this uh, equation. So here we have the total potential energy of our system. And it turns out that the equilibrium condition of a system can be found when this potential energy is a minimum, is the minimum, right? So what we need to do is to take this potential energy and we take the partial derivative of this. That's what we are looking at, at it here. And we equal it to zero. And at the end, what we'll get is a series of uh, ng times ng equations. So depending on how many degrees of freedom do we have, uh, we may have this number of equations. <laughs>
And once we do that, we for for this case of linear static analysis, you may have you may find that these equations they summarize uh, very very simple manner. The forcing vector or force is equal to the global stiffness matrix times the displacement matrix at each one of the degrees of freedom. Okay, and at the end, this is the equation that the software will be solving. So what the software draws inside is that, first of all, it estimates what are the displacements at each one of the nodes based on our stiffness matrix. We know our stiffness matrix because we know where are the interpolation functions, and we know also what are the material properties and the geometry itself. And Q, we know what is our loading, our boundary conditions, right? So we can solve, since we know this and we know this, and we know some components on some parts of this vector, we can solve Q. After we have Q that are the nodal displacements, we can find displacement field at any part inside the finite element using our interpolation function, our matrix, assembly matrix. And once we have this displacement, <clears throat> we can obtain our a, a strain tensor. And with the strain tensor, we can obtain what are our, the, the local stresses. Okay, guys, that's all for today. I hope this was helpful and thank you for watching.